this camera ready? <laughs> Cool. Hey guys, welcome to Art Subway. Today we have something really awesome in the works for you. We have a live in-person interview. Yay. With uh, Brian McSherry. Brian, how would you like us to introduce you? That was pretty good. No, I was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, I'm just a, um, you know, um, artist, attorney, educator. It's perfect. Yeah. And before we begin this interview, we decided we should be, you know, like on your level. Okay. So we created this appearance release for you to sign. Okay. <laughs> Do you think this even like worth it? Oh no, it's definitely legit. Especially if um like you're using um like artist works and showing and stuff like that. Yeah. So person appearing me. Do you think uh, the wording like matters that much? Oh, absolutely. Um. I mean, like, yes and no, I suppose, right? Like, it does, it depends on what you want to do, right? Like, you agree to appear on a show, um, you agree for your image and likeness to be used for uh, commercial or non-commercial purposes, uh, you agree for your work to be shown, and you can always do, like, tidbits, right? Like, is it shown on social media? Is it shown on a website? Yeah, I, this one is, like, downloaded somewhere from the web, so I don't know if it's that legit, but it's better than nothing, right? I didn't even read it. I just signed it. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know how. And we have an attorney here. Yeah, I right? just wanted to emphasize <laughs> just, that. Just, uh, I, was like, I was like, yeah, it's fine. So we know you have a degree in fine arts in art communication design and also a Juris Doctorate with a focus on intellectual property. Was there a moment where you decided to combine the two of them? I mean, kind of, I suppose. Like, you know, intellectual property always kind of interested me. Um, and, you know, art activism and graphic design, of course. And I, I was always looking for a way to combine graphic design and the law. So I was always, like, reading articles and things like that, such as an election being um, overturned because the typeface was 11 point instead of 12 point. So they redo the entire election because of a, a little art mistake. So I, was, I always found that stuff interesting. Um, and also kind of like, how do you prod, you know, <laughs> just culture in general? Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like, you know, if you're, if you're an artist and a designer, that's what you kind of do. You just kind of prod culture and society. And that's what I feel most attorneys do. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they don't have a case, they'll just still argue. You know, it's, it's what we do. It's great, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in good faith, of course, but... Uh, but yeah, I guess um, a point in time where I wanted to combine it, um, I was in college, it was my first semester, I had my sketchbook open, and another, a fellow classmate of mine stole my idea, and then we came in to critique with the same exact project, and I was like, oh, I definitely, I definitely want to learn about this, you know? <laughs> um, I saw several of your works, and I noticed you work in different disciplines, like mm -hmm. there is nothing that you, like you know, particularly uh, sticking to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I kind of, that's the thing, I kind of, kind of do everything. Anything that kind of interests me, um, I do. Because, um, I, you know, I'm a, a trained graphic designer, and even though I do, like, installation work and uh, performance art and graphic design and multimedia, for me, it's just, it's all really the same. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I hate the term, it's like, you know, what's the difference between an artist and a graphic designer? It's like the... How many times have we heard the argument? Absolutely. You know? Um, so for me, I kind of always forget that. I'm like, I'm just a visual communicator. And a lot of my work is influenced by case law. So if I'm doing a performance, it's based off of like a specific case I read about. Um, if I'm doing an installation work, it's about like maybe a couple different cases merged together and using um, the visual aspects to comment and critique on uh, case laws and statutes in order to find the gray areas in legal mm -hmm. terms and prod it with art and then hopefully find an answer. How do you decide which way you're going to challenge the law? Because I feel like what you're doing is challenging the law. Like uh, one of the pieces that I was uh, discussing with many today, mm -hmm. uh, the right to pu publicity. Yeah, so there's right of publicity laws, which is pretty much like a subset of intellectual property specifically for celebrity. So celebrities have like their own sort of form of copyright law, and this actually goes into um, the the form you gave, right? Um, of this idea of likeness mm -hmm. and personality and persona. Typical copyright is that the rule is you know it has to be um, 
have like an original work of authorship, original work of art, that's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So fixed and tangible medium of expression is like paintings, photographs, graphic design, things like that. Um, but if it's not fixed, right, then we're talking about performance art. So performance art is not copyrightable. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, celebrities are also not copyrightable because they're people. You know, they have their personas. Their persona is constantly changing, so it's not fixed. But the law has a specific carve out of right of publicity so that they're able to monetize their personas. If one case is Bette Midler, Bette Midler, um, I think it was a car commercial, had a voice actress sound alike of Bette Midler. And she sued and won over right of publicity because it was like, you used my likeness, my voice, even though it wasn't her voice. Uh, Johnny Carson from The Tonight Show, um, a porta potty company, is w called their company Here's Johnny, based off the Tonight Show logo, like Here's Johnny, um, sued, and then they had to change the name. Because even though it's a slogan, it's part of his persona. Hmm. Um, and then when Johnny Carson died, the company was like, let's do it again. And they did it again, and then they found out that even in death, celebrities have the right of publicity. So their mm -hmm. estates can sue. So who decides whether a person is celebrity or not? I think culture, really. Um, you know, culture decides, and also it's this idea of privacy. The more privacy you relinquish, the more of a celebrity you become. Um, and I think we're kind of seeing a, a new form of that with social media. I mean, even this, I'm, I'm giving away some of my personas, some of my... My likeness, right? You signed and a I signed, very legal I signed, paper. <laughs> I very, signed a very legal paper to, to you know, relinquish it. Um, so again, that's like part of the celebrity culture is you're giving away pieces of yourself. Um, but in return, in like a kind of like equivalent exchange of that is like you're giving away pieces of yourself in the hope of eventually reaching some sort of fame and leisure. Um, so it's kind of like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's that piece, and then using reflections of the image, and then selling the reflections. So the reflection is not fixed, because it's a reflection of an image. Yeah. But I am selling it, but am I really selling anything? Because you can't touch it. Mm -hmm. It's not real. So did you sell it? No, it's up for sale for a million dollars, though. So really? if anyone wants it, yeah, yeah we'll see. <laughs> how, do you, how do you put a price tag? Uh, it's the absurdity of it, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I think of like how absurd a piece is, and I'll just throw an absurd number on it, right? Okay. Because I think that comes into the art culture yeah. too, right? Because like, how do you price a work of art? I don't know. A million dollars? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, well, a million dollars. Well, why not, right? Yeah, no. It's a g great uh, advice for artists from Brian McSherry. <laughs> right, just throw up a big number. You know, if it sells, it sells. What types of laws like you go after, and how do you decide if you can actually change it or you can? just comment it well one thing I've been looking at and this is like you know the you know the pie in the sky project right mm -hmm. uh, you know if I had infinite money this would be the project and I I found a plot of land in like El Paso and the idea was to buy physical property and then create and what I wanted to do was a giant digital billboard that was that had different languages that said like everyone's welcome things like that mm -hmm. and you know, what I really wanted was it to be um, in the way of uh, future border wall construction so that this physical work of art could actually stop kind of like what I consider like hate speech, which is like this physical wall. And then using cases like Five Points, right? Like yeah. VERA, Visual Artist Rights Act. Um, so having the VERA case along with actually owning the property um, in order to counteract symbols of hate. So like a symbol of love versus a symbol of hate rooted in not only intellectual property, but real property itself. Pie in the sky, I would love mm -hmm. to do that project, but uh, well, I gotta sell the million dollar piece first yeah. to do that one, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's gonna sound like compliment or not, but um, after reviewing your work, I felt like you're sort of like an artist Robin Hood. Like, <laughs> anyway, <Thank you. laughs> because yeah, what you where you stand with the uh, copyright law, it feels like you are on the side of the artist, and yeah. you are on you know the side of artists uh, making money mm -hmm. off their work and being able to you know uh, get their work copyrighted. So yeah. do you do you feel like it's your mission maybe to uh, you know stand for artists? 
sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, I feel as though in our current socioeconomic, um, really even digital climate, you know, we've seen time and time again of, especially digital artists, you know, kind of, you know, getting ripped off constantly, or especially graffiti artists in particular, um, constantly being ripped off by um, corporations, right? Mm -hmm. H&M films in front of a graffiti mural. That's right. Right? They don't have to pay the graffiti artist, right? Because the graffiti artist can't copyright it. Even though it meets all the requirements, it's a pictorial work, right? Um, And it's fixed in a tangible medium expression because it's fixed upon a wall. But they're not able to get copyright on it because of the legality Mm -hmm. of the work itself. So it's kind of like this unclean hands doctrine. It's like, well, they made the work illegally, so they shouldn't get copyright. Even though, in my opinion, graffiti artists are the best typographers and graphic designers out there in the world, you know? Absolutely. Graffiti art often gets looked at almost like comic art as lowbrow art when it comes to, like, the leagues of art that is out there. But like you said, a graffiti artist is like the perfect typographer because mm-hmm. they do it on command. Yeah. They spend tedious hours just working on different hand styles, different letterings, and you create kind of a mythic legacy with their work. Yeah. Because if you look at a piece and you can't quite read it, you can still see the energy in its design and it's translatable. Yeah. But the idea of legibility versus illegibility. Uh. And I prefer the illegible. And... You know, even when I'm teaching my students, I'm like, sometimes you want your work to be illegible because you want, you want the audience to sit with it and have to sit with it for a while and figure it out Mm -hmm. instead of just being like, oh, it just said like, hey, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of your multidisciplines and digital art, the AR tags that you've created have a concept of a hidden message. Who is this hidden message for? You know, the, the AR graffiti pieces I've been working on is kind of like an offshoot of that pie-in-the-sky yeah. project. So it's, it's this idea of how do, you, how do you look at space and um, combat um, either hate speech or um, historical monuments that have, you know, um, like, that have like tedious histories behind them. You know, how do you, how do you reformat a space and considering that we're really now living in this digital world and that we're seeing AR and VR technology grow leaps and bounds over time um, I think the last last thing I read was that AR technology alone is looking to be like a 25 billion dollar investment opportunity in the next five years just because of how fast it's growing um, so I think it's really important that artists get in on the ground floor of this to shape what people can do with it um, instead of being told what you can do with it. So this is what I do to uh, test out my AR tags is before I do um, uh, ARJS and JavaScript on the web. I use Adobe Arrow and I take whatever assets I'm using and then I go to the space and I test it out. So this is uh, what would be a test. So these are two separate uh, videos in zip formats that are then uploaded and tagged to a geolocation such as the cube here where I'll put on different messages. And then what's really nice about it is that when you move through the space, you can move through the work. So how much time does it take you to create like this one tag? Did you just create it on the spot here? Uh, this, I mean, on the placement I did, to create one single tag, it depends on what I'm doing. So this one probably took, um, as far as the creation of the video, maybe about an hour. Uh, put it in the correct format, upload and everything like that. And then to put it in the space for the test, uh, I just did this on the spot. So this took approximately like two minutes. So once you see how it looks like this, then you can go back um, and using JavaScript uh, on the web, create a map that people can follow online for the spaces and then view markerless. But this is like a finished product people would see. 
can they just see it with their camera? Yep. That's yeah. It. Okay. This camera, yep, it'll work on um, Android and Apple, uh, iOS. How specific can you be of where the tag is in? Um, specific enough, because everything is based off of um, GPS coordinates. With the pandemic, it's been difficult to get to spaces to find the exact GPS locations. Because um, I like to use my phone because it gives me a better location as to exactly where I want to put it versus going onto Google Maps and dropping a pin. So it's better to always go into the space. You want to do it first to find the exact GPS location you want. Um, and the other thing too is you want to make sure you're doing it outside because inside it gets a bit iffy. Um, I did a piece at Trump Tower for the election and it had a couple of different aspects of it. But one was um, one of his tweets, which were obviously mm -hmm. now deleted because he yeah. got banned. Um, mm -hmm. But it was one of his tweets and then using um, After Effects, it glitches into like the real message, right? So it talks about how he's assaulted women and things yeah. like this so it gets like very yeah, I remember like, the piece right it gets very personal um but it's also geolocated tagged on trump tower itself which is a publicly owned private space it's mm -hmm. still you know privately owned by trump but one thing i'm doing with this space is i'm putting a nft tag within that geolocation so i'm looking to sell a virtual piece of trump tower that attacks Trump himself on on a marketplace. That's the only one I'm going to put up for sale because the rest are for the people, right? It's it's four messages that combat history. The one for sale for Trump Tower is literally just to, you know, if I can curse on the show, I would, but I can I or no? Um, do, you so can I'll do. Just, I'll say that. It's just so. going to be 18 plus. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I guess you know well, we can keep it keep it down. So I guess to mess mess with Trump and, and the Republican Party and this idea of um, you know privately owned public spaces that are constantly restricted, right? Because even though Trump Tower is a public space, it's always privately restricted. Can you keep it here for like as long as you want to? Yeah. You can basically target any monument you want. For example, right? Absolutely. I was just talking to many about like Black Lives Matter protests yep. and how the monuments uh, were, uh, you know, tagged by yeah. artists and created something like completely new, like a new piece. So oh. in that sense, we can use the digital art as well. Absolutely, you can create entire new digital sculptures to counteract those sculptures. So you can create something that's like the opposite of Christopher Columbus, or or you're speaking about his, uh, you know, his genocide as a digital sculpture in the physical space that people can interact with to view history in a different lens or actually a more correct lens. Yeah, so you can absolutely um, alter anything you want with it being completely legal and then existing in a new digital space. In order to make a change or uh, make a first step towards a change. You would need a large audience. So do people find it uh, on social media? Do they physically see it and can um, figure it out? How, yeah, how does it work? Like certain, certain pieces exist in like gallery spaces. Mm -hmm. um, others exist just on the web and social media and things of that nature. Um, one thing I would love is um, with this this map AR project is uh, this idea of having the audience become trespassers, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting because I'm just putting up this invisible work mm -hmm. and then almost such as like Pokemon Go or like any AR game, it's going to take the masses to kind of go into the physical space. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of also it's like, am I guiding people to trespass? So mm, Interesting. Uh, I don't know about that, but well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For it to be, you know, legal, um, you need it to be markerless. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, for me, I'm, I'm working strictly with, like, ARJS and stuff like that, just strictly with JavaScript, um, to do geolocations. Mm -hmm. And then put it up on the web where it's like, if you go to this location and open your phone, you'll see the work. So that way I don't have to do a sticker. Got it. So it's know. like drops of information. Through. Yeah. You know, if you put a Q, uh, QR sticker mm -hmm. on something... You're still breaking the law, yeah. Right, because it's a sticker. Mm -hmm. um, now I think like the fine is something like three hundred dollars or like whatever, but it still breaks the law. So, so my thing is like, how do I do this entire thing legally, but that's going to legally annoy 
a ton of people. And I, I worked on a piece that um, included a lot of markers placed mm -hmm. in a public location. And we were thinking, like, are we breaking the law or not? And we were bringing a lot of audience, too. Yeah. So, uh, would, would that, was that a break of the law? It was a pub, in a public park. Public park. Um, yeah, I mean, if you fixed, like, a sticker or a marker to mm -hmm. a spot, then technically, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm breaking, I'm breaking some laws. Breaking you know, <laughs> <laughs> it? Was it Judas Priest breaking the law? Breaking the law. Um. Respecting the law, respecting the law. Copyright law, copyright law. Even though you might break the law with certain things, um, is anyone actually going to enforce it? All right. So, like, there's so many stupid laws in the United States. And when I say stupid, I really mean it. Like, very stupid laws mm -hmm. um, that, you know, come from, like, the 1800s that are still in the books. So technically, there's still the law, but no one enforces it. You know, you can't wear cargo shorts on Sunday. Is anyone going to enforce mm -hmm. that? No, but it could be law. That monument was um, almost like a test, really, because the, the main place that's going to be is the John Muir Trail in Van Cortlandt Park. Um, that's actually where that piece initially resides. Um, and the reason it's there is because, um, you know, it turns out John Muir, who's a great uh, conservationist, uh, environmentalist, was also a bigot, right? He was a racist. Um, and I wanted to tag John Muir Trail to counteract that historical name and reframe it in a way where um, everyone's welcome like all these parks are for everybody which is very beneficial that we ended up in a park so but putting it on the on the cube um, it was just a good test area because it's such uh, such a staple right just such a, a monument in the city which is an illustration of what I plan to do around um, all of the city I think there is always a risk to even virtually tagging a building um, just because even though phones and tablets are so ubiquitous at this point, um, if there's security um, or police, they get very uncomfortable with it and they just don't want you in that space, in that physical space. So uh, at Trump Tower, you know, there was, you know, not only you know, security for the tower, but there's also uh, NYPD with, um, you know, holding assault rifles. Um, buildings are being boarded up at the time. Uh, the cops uh, would tell me to like, you know, to leave and I can't do this and things like that. You know, the same thing with just being a photographer in general. People just hate having cameras in their faces and things like that. And that's, that's the necessity about the AR pieces is you have to be not only a designer and a multimedia artist, but also a photographer and a documentarian, uh, which can be combative at time with, uh, say, owners of the buildings. You know, if, uh, if I felt like I was going to be, say, arrested or anything like that, um, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, um, I have a partner who is willing to bail me out. So eternally grateful for that. Do you ever use your um, I'm a lawyer card? Uh, not too much. Um, not really. Um, I guess on the occasion, I never really use it. I never use it with cops um, just because I feel as though that would be more combative and make the situation worse. Um, which is unfortunate, but it's the truth. Um, but like, you know, if it's, if it's like Disney Mickey Mouse security, then absolutely. Yeah. I think censorship mostly happens in the digital space um, because of copyright law and this sort of fear. Um, and we see it happen all the time, say with like YouTube and Twitch channels and, and things like that. But what I'm most worried about is um, I was really, really worried about this when um, when Trump was in office, 
was the abolishment of Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, because that act states that um, a platform is not liable for what the users put on it. Now, if you abolish Section 230, you're going to see a mass chilling effect of free speech on the Internet. Um, because the companies will be held liable, and if they're held liable, then they don't want anything posted that's not reviewed in triplicate. I've always been so interested between like the concept of the legality of murals versus like street art, and what makes like the difference. Yeah, I guess is the difference is the commission, right? It's the commission, and it's also um, it's also the permission. Right. Mm. So the reason five points went like ahead and the artists were able to win is because they were they kind of had this like unwritten permission. Right. Because the building owner like said, he's like, yeah, sure. Just, just you can do your work here in graffiti. So that was like permission to do the work. So five points turned into graffiti, but like really mural at that yeah. point because they had the permission, mm -hmm. which is why they won. Because like they didn't have to worry about it being illegal or legal, because it turned out it was legal once you kind of get permission. When it comes to the concept of street art, physical and digital, do you think that there's a space for digital street art, and is it as legitimate as physical street art? Oh. Um, is it as legitimate? Uh, yeah, this is just I think I think it's just opinion at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I prefer physical. But then again, I'm kind of like, you know, a little bit more old school in that fashion, right? It's like, right, you know, yeah. it's, it's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, the illegality of it is definitely, in my opinion, a really important aspect for it to be considered legitimate. So I'd say physically, without permission, is like the gold standard. And also, I think it's going to be really, really interesting where, where we see it go within the the next step of the digital age that's right you know like with wearable technologies and stuff like that so because at that point you know instead of being able to like click on a button to view the augmented stuff you could be wearing glasses and you don't, mm -hmm. have, you don't even have the option i think it's really important for um for really like all artists to kind of get in on the ground floor in order to create the space and influence the space before it gets influenced for us mm -hmm. you know I think it's great that you're advocating for that because it's literally the next wave of movement. You often wonder how art will truly evolve. You know, it kind of stops at like modernism mm -hmm. and kind of just has different variations and versions as you kind of move forward. Yeah. You haven't had like that big dynamic culture shift as of yet. Digital, yes, but there's still, like you said, some conversations happening and it's like, we'll see what happens. But with AR and VR work, it's just so interesting because it does feel like we're at a time where you do need to get in on the ground floor yeah. before it's, for the first time ever, kind of decided how artists make art versus artists just being like, oh, this is what it is. Let me experiment. Let me do this and a little bit of that yeah. and whatnot. Well, that's the other thing, too, that it's really exciting because, um, you know, it's really like the Wild West because there's, no, mm -hmm. there's no legislation over this yet. That's there's right. no... You know, we, we have the opportunity to to shape the, the legal language of it through the work. Um, in our previous conversation with you, you said that your goal as an artist is to be sued. <laughs> uh, can you paint a perfect scenario of this happening for us, a perfect for you as an artist? It would have to be um, with a work that discusses a, a gray area within, within language. Um, such as like the right publicity piece, you know, because you know, like any of the celebrities I use could sue me. Because it also goes into like this fair use question too of like commercial and non-commercial. And yes, it's in the commercial sense, it's in the commercial realm, but the work doesn't exist outside of a specific set time in a specific set location. So like, what is it? Like, am I infringing on your personality if you can only see it in under direct circumstances? And it's super ephemeral and doesn't quite exist, but does exist. So, you know, the courts would have to struggle with questions. And I, I always love that because the courts always say, you know, well, it's not us for, uh, you know, it's not up to us to judge what is and what is not art. But I was like, well, it kind of is because you kind of like, 
you kind of do. Yeah. yeah. Is there an artist you would prefer to sue you? A celebrity? Oh, a celebrity to sue me? Yeah. Um, I guess it'd be like, you know, like, what celebrity do I admire and want to meet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'd really, you know. <laughs> but would you want to, uh, you know, make the person you admire Yeah, mad? that's, I, I, you know, hopefully they get it. I don't, you know, but I guess if they got it, they wouldn't sue me. Yeah, right? I don't know, so. well, many yeah, of that I were was, talking about. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at the pieces, like, personally, if I was a celebrity, I'd be like, can we endorse this guy? Well, yeah. This guy's awesome. <laughs> made me see myself in a literal different light. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I guess, like, the estate of Bella Lugosi would be pretty cool. Oh. Um, because, you know, it's yeah. like, I'm like, well, you know, it's yeah. the picture of Dracula. It's definitely. on a mirror, and so, yeah. a little meta joke. You know? Right? Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. Nos partiremos a manhã, a noite. Were there any precedents of artists changing the law that way? Because what seems to you me, know, like, some cases, yeah. they were able to do that, but unintentionally. That's the thing, yeah. Or they were contributing to like the bigger picture like other people changing the law together yeah i mean i'd say you know like of course like the five points case you know definitely changed the way legal scholars look at copyright and, and street art um so of course that's going to influence um another influence um is uh, chapman kelly um with uh wildflower works uh yeah I, I wanted to bring up that case too yeah uh, city of Chicago, and uh, the artist made two giant elliptical flower beds in the park, and then you know would continue to maintain it and things of that nature, and then over time the park wanted to do some some sort of new construction, so they they destroyed half of it pretty much, so the artist sued like you destroyed my work, and they found that the work wasn't copyrightable and if it's not copyrightable you don't have a claim to bring up right um of destruction so if a work is copyrightable um then you also have vera protection which is the visual artist rights act and in that it means that a copyrightable work that's destroyed by somebody else that's illegal so the person who destroyed it has to pay the artist how much the work was worth they're like, well, it's not copyrightable because your work wasn't fixed in a tangible medium of expression because it was just flowers. Hmm. But the artist was like, well, no, it's a painting, but it's a painting done with flowers. So I always found that interesting, this idea of, of what, is, what is considered fixed, right? So that's something that always kind of like blew my mind. So this exhibition coming up of Kusama and New York Public Garden, Mm -hmm. It is not a copyrightable piece. It doesn't belong to the artist. Um, it is and it's not. It depends on, again, I think it also depends on celebrity. Mm -hmm. right? I think the more famous of an artist you are, the easier it is for you to work on the fringe of the legal spectrum and get away with it. So the law favors uh, fame? I, the law favors the fame. The law favors the rich. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hate to sound so cynical on that. But I think time and time again we've seen that, so I think I'm just really look at the empirical data. I think specific areas are still problematic, and the law, in my opinion, and copyright law, does not does not look too kindly upon, um, you know, anything that wouldn't exist like outside the map, you know, or like you know, or or like, you know, if it's something that pushes things, right? If if you're a bio artist, mm -hmm. they're not going to look too favor favorably on you. Um, and we've seen, you know, not just with copyright, but we've seen censorship issues too with um, art that kind of, I'm going to say lives on the edge, but brings up questions. You know, an artist in the, like, 2007, I think, a um, uh, bio artist gets arrested for terrorism, right? Mm -hmm because um, he was using um, specific microbiomes that were actually found not harmful. But, like, criminal charges against artists like that. And, you know, if you look at um, University of Western Australia, there's a lab called Symbiotica out there. And, you know, stellar clips there. Um, so, you know, a guy who puts an ear on his arm and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, <coughs> but... Um, 
yeah, I don't think the law takes too kindly on on artists who mess with science. Mm-hmm. I think is the best way to put it. If you're if you're a scientist who's an artist or an artist who's a scientist, you're gonna have a tough go of it. Just because I think people just don't understand or don't want to understand art like that, um, which mm-hmm. is unfortunate. Because personally, I think it's one of the reasons that we have flat grown meat. It kind of started out as an art project. Mm-hmm. Now we have an entire industry based off of it. Can it be in a way helpful for uh, the artistic community in general to have those prominent artists to push? the law and be protected um i i think it it is out to prominent artists to to help um underrepresented artists for sure um in in copyright and fair use andy warhol just lost you know um the prince case like last week i think um so again like you know prominent artists living and dead still fighting these cases (laughs) which is like really interesting Mm -hmm. um but again, I think if you're an appropriation artist, again, I think it, t- it kind of ties into the street art. It kind of ties into this like illegality of it, you know. And I think that's what kind of gives it this monetary value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So illegality is um, generally a helpful tool for art. I mean, I think so because I think you know, it's the the more tension you get with it, um, or perhaps, you know, in one sense, it's the attention you get with it. Right. But in, in the other sense, it's also perhaps like the message you're trying to convey. Um, and the other thing, too, is, you know, especially with with underrepresented artists, you know, um, it's really, really expensive um, to get licenses for these images. What do you think of an artist like Banksy, for example? Banksy is really good. The, I guess the fortunate, unfortunate thing, or vice versa, is when he shredded that piece at auction. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, really smart. But the problem is it just became more expensive after it's destroyed. Yeah. So, um, so again, I think that also ties into that thing. of like the more absurd it is, mm-hmm. the, the more illegal it is, the That's more right. it's going to sell, the more it's going to push the boundaries. But it's going to make a comment and critique. I and think we're definitely getting an 18 plus people on this show. Because <laughs> we're like, let's all get a legal artist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I don't know, it's interesting. I mean, like, Ron English bought a piece from, mm. from Banksy um, just so that it wouldn't go up for auction, right? Just so he could whitewash it, right? Just so he could destroy it. Mm-hmm. Because you see people literally tearing pieces of buildings off the structure and selling it. Like is Banksy copyrighted at all? I mean, it depends, right? If it's if the work is like on a wall and whatnot, then then no. But if there's another image of it that's just digital, right? Mm-hmm. That goes back into the whole entire idea of like the physical versus the, the digital. digital. Mm-hmm. The digital would be copyrighted. Mm-hmm. Right? But it's not as cool as the physical. That's so interesting on the topic of Banksy, Ron English, Shepard Fairey, even a yeah. uh, street artist, invades, invader, uh, yeah. street artists that go on to have celebrity status and superstardom. Do you think that because they have this superstardom now, should they be stripped of the title of being a street artist? Oh. If Shepard Fairey tags Obey on this wall building, is it still street art? Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, so, like, that's it, like, right. <laughs> Again, I guess it kind of goes into that idea of like right of publicity, right? Because the more and more famous you get, That's right. the less and less privacy you get. Um, so at that point, does you know is the artist is the artist and the artist persona more of the art than the art itself, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think the moment that you you get that superstardom. And then you start using the laws that you actually broke against other up and coming artists. And yeah. Not great. Not yeah. something you would respect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So on the subject of visual artists or even designers and fair use, what are some tips that you can possibly give them to I guess what are some tips that you can give them in terms of using fair use property as an element in their art to sell? Ah, okay, so um so first and foremost, I always have to do the disclaimer. This is not legal advice. Um, <laughs> um, tips I would give is, 
I think, you know, one, um, read, read the statutes, the actual law, um, because they're not long. It's literally, I think, like 10 sentences. You know, 10 sentences that kind of govern what we as artists can and can't do. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Um, so I'd say read the law, look at other appropriation artists, um, and specifically look at cases they've won versus cases they've lost and try to figure out why. Hmm. There was one case. There was a Richard Friends <laughs> case. I got to I just, it's, it's in, it's it, literally in the, the, the case where, you know, they asked, they're like, well, why'd you put, you know, the guitar on, on this person? He's like, well, I just thought it looked cool. <laughs> so again, there was no message or comment or critique on that. So that's not fair use. Right? It was like it wasn't comment. He was like, I thought it looked cool. That's not a good reason. You always have to make a comment and critique mm. on the work you're using. Mm. When you're thinking about fair use and copyright and you're using someone else's image, always think about why are you using this image and what comment and critique are you making on this specific image and how are you transforming it? I think, I think being transformative is the most important thing um, for appropriation artists, right? You've got you to gotta put something else back into the world that has a new uh, meaning. Specific laws that you want to target mm-hmm. and change right now. What, are you, what would you approach first? Or maybe you were already working on it. Yeah, I suppose one, I'd, I'd target that idea of fixation, right? Because there's really no answer on it. Um, and especially you go like jurisdiction, jurisdiction, they have like different rules. So so that's one thing I'd really like to target. Um, you know, there's there's two computer cases with it. They're like, well, you know, if a program loads up within 2.5 seconds, that's considered fixed. I'm like, sorry, so we got one rule that's two, 2.5 seconds, we've got like another that's like, oh, two minutes and it's fixed. I'm like, well, what, what, is, what is this number? What, what, what do we have here? Um, so the idea of fixation, I'd, I'd really like to target, um, just so that we, as artists, have um, a better idea of what we can and can't do. So I'd say that's that's the one thing I'd really like to target. Um, because the other thing, too, is like, you know, um, you know, like a terrarium, mm-hmm. right? It's living art, but mm. it's also kind of fixed because it's within a structure. Like, mm-hmm. What's the answer on this, right? How can we use bio art for that? So. Mm-hmm. so let's say it happens, you change the law mm-hmm. with the, your art. Would you be creating more work in that genre? I, you <laughs> let's know, call I, it that. I don't, you know, if, if, I, if I changed it for the better, hopefully, yeah. you know, um, yeah, if I change it for the better, then I'd, I'd just move on to the next thing. If I change it for the worse, I feel really bad. Do you <laughs> think I, it can happen? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, you never know what way a, you know, courts can decide. So I think that's also the, the issue. Mm. Right? And do you think you would be viewed differently by the court if you are known as this artist that deliberately creating that is deliberately creating art to change the laws? I don't think they'd look too favorably on it. Um, Just because with the way my art practice is, it's like, okay, you deliberately broke this law. You know, so they'd be like, you chose to do this. Conceptually, it's correct, right? But um, practicality, not, Mm -hmm. right? Um... Matt Clark, right, Gordon Matt Clark, um, bought up different areas of real estate that went for auction in the 1970s in New York City. And the idea is if you buy up little parcels of land, right, like little easements, like spaces in between buildings, and then you put a sculpture in there that's protected by Vera, it's copyright, Vera protected, so no one can destroy it, which means that you could stop construction. So conceptually really strong practically again is a court going to allow it probably not Mm -hmm. right because who are you you're just an artist that's a big corporation so i guess what i'm doing is i'm trying to challenge the practicality 
of mm-hmm. of our current structure. A lot of times, corporations will steal steal from graffiti artists. Graffiti artists will sue, but before you get an answer from a judge, hmm. they'll settle out of court because the corporation doesn't want the answer. They don't want the law to change. They want to make sure that graffiti art is still considered illegal, hmm. mm-hmm. so that they continue to steal from it drag the artists through the legal mud and then pay them off right at the end because the average is for instance the average copyright case costs about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you're an unknown artist you don't have the money to fight Mm -hmm. so there's there's definitely disparities so in that sense do you feel like there is an element that you might need in your work as an artist um the, this element, the fame, and that you and and do you go after it at all or not? Um, not really. Um, you know, I don't like my social media presence isn't that huge. Right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't have a Twitter or anything like that. You know, um, I have an Instagram, and that's it. You know, I don't have Facebook or, or I just I just hate it, <laughs> which is unfortunate because I probably need it. Um, but so going after it, not really. Um. I think it's the um, kind of a little bit of being naive on my part about, you know, putting my work out there and expecting people to find it without having the publicity behind it. So, um, so chasing fame, um, not so much. Hoping for it, yes. Chasing it, no. Um, the other thing too is I'm just a huge nerd who loves research. Mm-hmm. You know, I love teaching, I love research, um, and I love writing and things of that nature. So the other thing too is like you know what I'll write about this stuff. I'll go speak at conferences and things of that nature, and you know get things published. It's academia. Mm-hmm. Who reads an academic journal? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like. Come on, you know, I'm in it. I, mean, I, I don't even. It. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in it. I don't even read this stuff, you know. So, I think it's. I think it's difficult. On the topic of your work and how you create it, has COVID nineteen presented any challenges within the year of you making your work? Have you faced any obstacles? Yes, absolutely. Doing this air graffiti um, has been an absolute pain in the course <laughs> of the pandemic. Um, so I only have like two or three pieces up just because of travel, right? Like it's tough to get around. I'm pretty sure if you opened up a camera in my neighborhood, it would just be littered with test objects that are just everywhere. Like it's all in one space outside my apartment building. It's like a digital dumpster. Wow. <laughs> you know, of just things of like things that worked and didn't work that are broken. Uh, it's just all over the place. Um, but besides that, I'll be honest with you, there has been some really good stuff that came out of this year. So my background is in traditional print graphic design Mm. and studio art. Um, you know, I spent the year learning augmented reality graffiti. You know, I spent the year learning more, you know, more JavaScript language. Um, spent the year learning 3D modeling with Blender, um, just because I was locked in. So I had nothing else to do. Wow, yeah. I love how you described your like whole neighborhood as like this big dump of like what works and what doesn't work. In the sense it's like you've created this AR sketchbook. Yeah. In the sense of just all your various ideas and it kind of looks like a wonderland of just so much stuff I can't even comprehend. It looks like the broken version of the cyberpunk game. <laughs> <laughs> Glitches and all. Glitches and all. Glitches and all. You know? Uh. And that was around November, too. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Working in tandem with CD Projekt Red. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they should hire me. <laughs> so, are there any works of art or, you know, any type of art uh, that inspired you? Definitely Dadaism. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I consider my work absurd. Mm. So, that whole entire art movement was about absurdity. Really, just just that whole art movement has really influenced... Um, my entire practice of being an artist, an attorney, a performer, 
You know, I always think about Hugo Ball dressed up as a robot in 1918, singing nonsense. That speaks to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, you know, the other thing, too, with the Dada movement, it's a lot of appropriation art that's just mm. absurd, and there's no reason behind it. So, um, and then, you know, as far as, like, contemporary works goes, um, you know, Banksy, for sure. Um, uh, Space Invader, I always found really, really interesting, um, just because, I mean, like, the whole practice is appropriation, yeah. you know, based on a video game. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I always found that really fascinating. Um also, I love, like, when you're able to actually find a piece, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like, I found one I found one in Brooklyn one time. Wow. I was in Paris, I found one. It was like, I was like, this is awesome. Wow. Oh, Space Invader? Space yeah, Invader, there's one yeah. on 14th Street. Yeah, Right yeah. by the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was I was like, like is that like, really him? Like, yeah, I was, like, I was like, when I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I can't, you know, Stefan Sagmeister is mm -hmm. like, one of my heroes, which is the absurdity of the work. Um, especially his banana typeface, hmm. you know, that just rotted in an art gallery. <laughs> Love that, you know? You know, it's increasing artists using social media to promote themselves or even sell their work. Um, and there, I feel like many opportunities for them to get sued as well mm -hmm. for any copyright infringement, for example. How do artists uh, protect themselves in that field? And is it even possible? Is it worth the energy? Or you should just, like, do your art and, you know, care about being sued later? I mean, I would say do your art and care about being sued later. Um, one reason for that, say for instance, right, and again, like, nothing I say is legal advice. <laughs> um, always that disclaimer. But, you know, if, um, if someone goes to sue me or, or something like that, um, I'm like, go, I'm like, go, I'm like, you're not gonna get anything. Like, there's no blood in this stone. Like, I'm not famous enough yet to get it because it costs so much money to sue somebody. You want to make sure that whatever damages you get is gonna cover your legal bills. Otherwise, you're in the red, right? Um, uh, a photographer, a photographer. Uh, I think his name is Thomas. Wasn't like morale or something of that nature. Um, Associated Press used his photograph um, and he sued. Now, he was awarded, I believe, $1.5 million in damages. But the case cost him $2.5 million. So even though he won, he lost. So I think, I think that's the thing, right? You want to make sure that, that the juice is worth the squeeze mm -hmm. um, if you're suing somebody. Right, if you get a copyright takedown notice, um, for instance, I think it was like off camera, we were talking about YouTube and, and automatic takedowns and things like that. A lot of times mm. it's all bull, you know, mm. it's just automatic takedowns for automatic takedown sakes. Mm. You know, um, they, don't, they don't really watch the video, so your work could be fair use, but they just take it down anyways. So, mm -hmm. so I, think it's, I think it's an interesting thing about, you know, if someone, if you, get an automatic takedown you go yeah no that that wasn't right like my work is is good and it's legal this shouldn't have happened so what if, if you're an artist and you are being sued uh, on let's say you know you're a graffiti artist mm -hmm. so you're being sued for a damaging property for example um, are there any resources for artists? Are there any uh, tools for them to use? Uh, Free attorneys? Like what? Yeah. Should they go after first? The there's uh, there's an organization um, in New York, but in also other um, cities. There's one in um, Minneapolis. I know of VLA, um, and VLA is pretty much uh, volunteer lawyers for the arts. So they'll take on cases. Um, they also do um, like programs where it's like, you know, how to write a contract, like, like an artist, how do you write a contract? Um, you know, how do you, um, how do you catalog your work and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, how do you set up an estate? So they do all these things, but they'll also do representation, like free representation for, um, for artists. Um, so 
I would highly, highly suggest, um, you know, whether you're in trouble or not in trouble, checking them out. Um, <laughs> you know, preferably not in trouble. Because, uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, go, go to one of their programs, go to one of their lectures. Um, they're a really, really important, really, really great organization um, that I have nothing but admiration for. Do you think there may be, like, some artists that would follow your footsteps? and trying to change the laws deliberately. I hope so. I definitely see more artists going down a legal path um, out of, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of times out of frustration, um, which is unfortunate. I'd, I'd rather people um, go down the art and law path out of um, curiosity rather than frustration. Um, but I guess that's, that kind of speaks to the times, especially with the the future economy of the arts um you know because uh you know right now it's kind of run by pirates to say it lightly mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like auction houses and stuff and all that, you know? um free trade zones and all these things it's, it's not great um doesn't doesn't really speak to what art's supposed to be about um in my opinion again that's just my opinion It'd be mm -hmm. great to have a little little army of artist mm -hmm. attorneys. Just really Maybe pushing. some of your students. That would be great if some of my students end up, you know, going through everything like that. Um, I would definitely tell them to do it differently than I did it. Because um, I did my MFA and my JD at the same time, and that was a nightmare. Um, so I'd say take your time with education. Don't rush it. Um, like, I did that because I was able to save a year. Mm. Right? But I kind of wish I still had that year. Without, like, saying anything bad, but, like, in the way future, what do you want put on your epitaph in terms of your, your art, your movement, everything that you've done? Oh, um... Here oh, that's lies. A really, here, here lies. 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 Um, uh, I guess maybe, maybe he poked the bear one too many times. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You gotta have like an awesome like image of a bear. Of a bear, yeah, <laughs> just, just like, like right, yeah, bear, like... <laughs> an annoyed bear. <laughs> so yeah, pro probably something like that, you know, wow. um, something something of the absurd. <laughs> That's perfect. That's great. Yeah. What would you have on yours, Manny? Yeah. Oh man, um, he figured it out with the question mark. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I think that like encapsulates my whole artist journey. Thinking I figured it out, and then realizing, nope, there's so much more <laughs> to learn and do. Yeah. So it's like, even in death, he figured it out. Well, like, that's <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Yeah. Yeah, mine would not be, like, so short and smooth. <laughs> long, <laughs> long essay. <laughs> no, but something probably, like, she always said, uh, we'll sleep in your grave. And now she's sleeping. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. I have to change mine. I want mine to have nothing to do with art. I want mine to be very inviting. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. So people continue coming. To yeah. Us. It's like thanks for coming. I think that that's that's appropriate because it's not every day the grave welcomes you. Yeah. You kind of go to see someone. So and then like, like you can probably true. yeah set like an automat like an automation email like, <laughs> saying like thank you for visiting yeah. my yeah. grave. <laughs> It's like a LinkedIn recruiter, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Last question. Can we use the videos off of your website? Yes. Do you give us the official permission? You have 100% the official permission. Also, I think it's in the release there, too. Yeah. Um, well, the videos yeah. of your website are on the release? No. I think so, yeah. This says you can use images and oh stuff. Oh, my God. We have a better form than we thought. <laughs> we <don't. laughs> Did we even read it? Wow. <laughs> we did. Um, but thank you so much, Brian. Oh. It was... Uh, so interesting to oh, talk. thank you well yeah it was like honestly it was great thanks for having me like, this is fun absolutely that wraps up our subway's first interview series, uh episode one thank you guys for watching and make sure to like share comment and subscribe for more content stay tuned <laughs>